Hello, welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams, your one watt golden voice of public affairs programming in the Twin Cities area. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we got another really packed episode. Uh, this one is not running around a central theme as a lot of our shows do. By the way, you can check out our uh, archives on uh, Facebook and YouTube, facebook.com slash Oasis or youtube.com slash Oasis. So we actually are going to be covering a little bit more ground today than uh, organized around a central theme. I, I really do like when we can discuss a central theme for a whole hour, but sometimes news just gets in the way of all of that. So that's kind of what today's episode is going to be around. And we are actually going to start off with um, our Prager University segment and talking about the states. How can states, uh, how the states can save America? Let's check it out. The federal government has become a lumbering giant. With each passing year, it gets bigger and scarier. In 1965, Washington was $761 billion big. In 2016, it was three and a half trillion, five times the size. If the government spent only the money it collected in taxes, that would be one thing. But it always spends more, which is why we're $20 trillion in debt. That's 13 zeros, count them, 13. But the crazy spending isn't even the worst of it. Washington is involved in every part of our lives. Think about anything you do from driving your car to buying your groceries to mowing your lawn. Whatever it is, your education, your job, your health, the government has its hands on your shoulder, if not on your throat. As a congressman and senator for 14 years, I know this only too well. So how do we cut this giant down to size? Is it even possible? Yes. And the amazing thing is the answer is right in front of us. The Founding Fathers in their wisdom foresaw the situation we find ourselves in today. They wrote into the Constitution a way to repair Washington, not from the inside, because that will never happen, but from the outside, where it might. It's right there in Article 5. Most people are familiar with the first part. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution. All 27 amendments we have now started this way. Congress proposed them, and at least three-quarters of the states ratified them. But is this the only way to amend the Constitution? Well, let's read the next clause. It says that Congress, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments. Did you catch that? Congress must call a convention to amend the Constitution if two-thirds of the states, that's 34 states, demand it. The time has come to demand it. The time has come to propose amendments that will restore meaningful limits on federal power and authority. The time has come for a convention of states. Here's how it would work. Once the 34 states call a convention, all 50 states send a delegate to represent their interest. For any constitutional amendments proposed, each state gets one vote, and an amendment only passes out of the convention and to the states for ratification if a majority of the state's delegates vote in the affirmative. In this scenario, Congress has no say. It is completely in the hands of the states, which means it's a whole lot closer to the hands of the people. We've never once amended the Constitution this way, but that doesn't mean we can't. But you might ask, doesn't this open the door to rewriting the entire Constitution? Antonin Scalia, the late Supreme Court Justice, acknowledged this risk, but regarded it as a minimal and reasonable one. Why? Because to be ratified, a proposed amendment would need the approval of 38 states. That's a high bar. 38 states would never agree to something radical like abolishing freedom of speech. The founders, Scalia said, knew the Congress would be unwilling to give attention to many issues the people are concerned with, particularly those involving restrictions on the federal government's own power. So they provided the Convention of States as a remedy. This should not be a partisan, left-right, Democrat-Republican issue. This should be a who-controls-your-life issue. 
you or the government. Today, politicians can turn your life upside down on a whim, kind of like King George in 1775. Being at the mercy of distant, disconnected rulers was why the American Revolution was fought in the first place. But we don't need a revolution. We have Article 5. So what amendments might a convention of states propose to limit Washington's power? Term limits, for one, and no one should be in Congress for 20 or 30 years. The only people who disagree have been in Congress for 20 or 30 years. And how about a limit on taxes, spending, and borrowing? Since you began this video, the national debt has gone up $8.4 million. Here's one more idea. A constitutional amendment that Congress can't exempt itself from the laws it passes. Something it's done dozens of times, from insider trading to Obamacare. Now, I don't believe a convention of states will solve all of America's problems. But the founders put it in the Constitution for a reason. They knew a time would come when Washington would become so big and so intrusive that only we, the people, could cut it down to size. That time is now. I'm Jim DeMent for Prager University. It isn't just the federal government that grows, it's also the state government that grows. Uh, even though we do not have a, um, a uh, convention of counties for the Minnesota state uh, amendments. Uh, we have a different process for that. But the fact is, government grows. Uh, when I first moved, I'm not from Minnesota. I did not grow up here. When I first moved here, the uh, budget was about, I want to say, around $13 billion a year. So $26 billion per biennium. I might, I might even be incorrect in that because it that's been almost 30 years. That I mean, it might have even been smaller than that. But the fact is, right now we're dealing with a budget in around forty billion dollars, forty-five billion dollars a biennium, so about twenty billion dollars a year. That's with a B. And yet, our population has remained stable at five, around five point three million people in the state. That's been pretty constant for the last four decades, maybe. And granted, we're at the threshold of uh, potentially losing another uh, congressional district at the next redistricting. Uh, Minnesota was on the bubble for that the last time, and I think it was Missouri that lost. It was between Minnesota and Missouri. Missouri lost theirs, but we haven't done anything to increase our state's population while other areas are facing tremendous population growth. Our budget has been, essentially in 30 years, it's doubled maybe even higher than that. I don't have the exact numbers. I was just looking for them a little bit ago. But we have way too big of government and we have a huge tax burden for our citizens and we have not increased our, the number of businesses and we also haven't increased the population in this uh, state. So we're just a microcosm. And you Take a look at what they just pointed out about how big the federal government has grown. And the national debt has grown. You know, when I was born in 1971, and around the t that time, we were dealing with about a $729 billion national debt. Are you aware that our interest payments in a single given year alone in 2017 are rivaling that? Two years we surpass the in, in, in interest payments on the national debt. We surpass the entire size of the debt in 1976 dollars uh, from 1972. Already in my lifetime, we are exceeding or, get, or getting close to exceed the entire size of the debt from when I was young to when I'm middle aged. Our interest payments alone cover that. Do you think that government might be growing a little bit too much? Anyhow, that's today's Prager University segment, something to give you some thought regarding. We're also going to take a look at something that happened uh, just yesterday, since today is December 7th, 2017. Uh, yesterday, something happened, and it was a historical moment. Now, one can argue that everything that happens in any given day is part of history as soon as it's done, but there was something that is going to be remembered for a thousand years. It happened yesterday. And I'll tell you this, it was around 1997 when 
this was started. This whole thing was you know, really then. Well, we'll just get into it in just a minute. But we're going to show you what President Donald J. Trump signed yesterday. Thank you. When I came into office, I promised to look at the world's challenges with open eyes and very fresh thinking. I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. While previous presidents have made this a major campaign promise, they failed to deliver. Today, I am delivering. I've judged this course of action to be in the best interests of the United States of America and the pursuit of peace between Israel and the Palestinians. I have determined. So that's what happened. Um, what has happened in the past, go back to, well, 1948. Let's go back to 1948 when the State of Israel was created. There were a lot of forces that did not want President Harry Truman to recognize Israel's existence. They, he, they did not want him. Military leaders, members of Congress, both parties, pretty much told Harry Truman, don't do this. Don't, don't give Israel anything. We don't want trouble. We don't want to make waves. Let's just let them do the stuff that they need to do over there. We'll just keep out of it. And Harry Truman had the gall to say, no, we're going to recognize Israel. And that's what he did, 1948. 1997, Congress had passed authorization to move the capital from Tel Aviv over to Jerusalem. President Bill Clinton signed a waiver keeping the embassy in Tel Aviv. It's renewed about every six months. Every president from Bill Clinton, essentially Bill Clinton, George H.W. Bush, or excuse me, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and even go before that where, you know, the previous presidents, Nixon, Ford, Reagan, George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, you know, they, they talked about it, but nobody had actually taken any action. President Trump signed one waiver. One waiver, but he had not done his Middle Eastern tour yet. And so now he, it's time to not do the waiver. And I, w I heard it explained to me this way. The United States Capitol is in Washington, D.C. It's not New York City. Why would any country want to locate their embassy in New York City or Minneapolis or St. Paul when the seat of the United States government is Washington, D.C.? Why would we put a Fran our embassy in France in Marseille when the capital is Paris? Why would we put our... Uh, capital uh, in, in uh, our embassy in Russia in Vladivostok or St. Petersburg when the capital is Moscow. So what President Trump is doing is recognizing Israel's seat of government. And keep in mind, Israel is a capital that goes all the way back 3,000 years, back when King David selected that area where Jerusalem was plotted as the capital city, the Temple Mount. And we've covered a lot of this in, uh, you know, earlier this year. And the Temple Mount, that was built, selected by David, built by Solomon. That has been the capital of the Jewish people for 3,000 plus years. Their seat of government, not just for the Israelis, but also for the Palestinians, is in Jerusalem. So it makes complete sense that the United States Embassy be located in Jerusalem. Tel Aviv is not the capital of Israel. Jerusalem is, per the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, even though that clip did not specify 
Uh, President Trump did add to his words that this is in no way, shape, matter, or form to interfere with the peace negotiations going on between both the Israelis and the Palestinians. That this is not a policy move, this is a move based upon historical precedence with the signing of the legislation from 1997 that this stays in line with what Congress had directed. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, uh, but what he, what he did not want to have happen is the U.S. is doing this and we're doing it for, for uh, public policy purposes and we're not, we're going to take sides in the matter. Trump even specifically said, let me be clear, I'm not taking sides in this matter that we still want to have a peace negotiation between the two, but it's got to be from the Israelis and the Palestinians in order to negotiate that peace. And the United States having the embassy in Israel, I mean in Jerusalem, does in no way, shape, matter, or form interfere on that process. So now let's take a look at what uh, Mahmoud Abbas and Benjamin Netanyahu from uh, Palestine and Israel have to uh, say about Trump's declaration. And we're going to start off with Benjamin Netanyahu. I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. We're profoundly grateful for the President for his courageous and just decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and to prepare for the opening of the U.S. Embassy here. I call on all countries that seek peace to join the United States in recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital and to move their embassies here. مسيحية إسلامية وهي عاصمة دولة فلسطين الأبدية. And that is the reaction. I know you had to read that. Uh, sorry about that, but I, I, I'm not a Palestinian speaker. Anyhow, we do have uh, Jews and Palestinians living in the Twin Cities. Here is a local reaction to the move yesterday. Today, President Donald Trump shrugged off opposition from the Arab world and European leaders as he recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. This is a long overdue step to advance the peace process and to work towards a lasting agreement. Jerusalem is Israel's holiest city, but it is also home to one of Islam's holiest sites. The Israeli Prime Minister thanked the President and said his announcement will advance peace. However, the advisor for the Palestinian president says the decision signals the end of Washington's role as a mediator for peace. Our Susan Elizabeth Littlefield shows us how personal President Trump's decision was to some Minnesotans. Hi, it, Susan Elizabeth. Hey, Frank. You know, it really was personal. Jerusalem is a holy land for Jews, for Muslims, and for Christians. People of all three faiths really feel a connection to this city. And for them, this is a big deal. Jerusalem is more than 6,000 miles from the Twin Cities, but it's close to some Minnesotans' hearts. I have a deep connection to Israel. It's one of the most important things in my life. St. Paul's Temple of Aaron is deeply connected to Israel, and so is the rabbi, Jeremy Fine. He's taken several from his temple on tours, and he lived there for two years. Jews have considered Jerusalem the capital of Israel for 3,000 years. So uh, the move isn't a shock. The move he's talking about is President Trump's announcement that the U.S. will now consider Jerusalem the capital. I think it's a good thing because I think that's what Israelis want. But the announcement has different implications for another Minnesotan of faith. Immediately just another um, shock and sadness that this president has absolutely no sensitivity to very common, well-established issues. Jelani Hussein worries that the new proclamation will stir up dissension with the Palestinians. As a Muslim American uh, and someone who uh, deeply uh, cares about Jerusalem uh, and the Palestinian people and as well as the, the, the Jewish community, I see this as another way to really create havoc and create chaos 
uh, in an area that has been so long desired for peace and has been seeing some progress in the past few years. One thing that is very mutual, both men I talked with respect each other's faiths very much. They are hoping and praying that this decision does not cause any violence in Jerusalem. We will see over the coming days, of course. Yeah, right? and months and years, who knows? Mm -hmm. We'll see for sure. All right, thank you, Susan Elizabeth. The location of the United States Embassy in a foreign country is not there to create havoc. We currently have a consulate in Jerusalem, which is an extension of the embassy. So changing from a consulate to a full-fledged embassy does not create havoc, no matter what the representative from CARE has to say. If you want to make peace, be peaceful. It's the way I look at it. I mean, the location of a building representing another government does not impede on the ability to make peace. That tells me that CARE has the problem. Anyhow, we're going to move on to something else here because uh, while we're talking about creating havoc, 76 years ago today, the Japanese uh, really had given us havoc and we lost a couple of thousand people at Pearl Harbor. So uh, we're going to take a look at President Trump and his proclamation for today on Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. As we go to meet the foe, just remember Pearl Harbor as we do the Alamo. We shall always remember how they died for liberty. Just remember Pearl Harbor and go on to victory. Yeah. <laughs> well, can I say? Well, He's a very shy person. Too. <laughs> Today, our entire nation pauses to remember Pearl Harbor and the brave warriors who on that day stood tall and fought for America. As I signed the proclamation making this national Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day, I ask that God continue to bless and watch over each of you as very, very special people to our country. And God is watching over you, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Pearl Harbor is one of those moments that is really, really special to me. And for those of you who have um, watched this program for a while, I think you know why. I've, I've known some Pearl Harbor survivors. Uh, two people that I, well, three people I really want to highlight. Um, one is uh, Dick Thill, uh, Richard Thill. We, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, our producer Dallas Pearson and I had interviewed uh, Mr. Thill a couple of years ago, and he was on the USS Ward crew, and we had a very extensive, in-depth interview with him. Part of what we had put together was actually used in the 75th anniversary commemoration by the state last year. Um, but it, you know, to, you know, it's a tremendous honor to be able to be in the presence of somebody who went through Pearl Harbor and I learned a few things from him. Uh, another one is Ernie Matson. Ernie had passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was on the USS Nevada and uh, he was also a survivor of the fires of 1918. So he was a survivor of two major tragedies that were going, that were going on in his lifetime. And Ernie was a great harmonica player uh, and a really, really great guy. And he, He's one I, I'm really, really honored to be able to call a friend, not just an acquaintance, not just somebody I've met, but I mean, really, I was a friend of Ernie's, and that to me is even a bigger, tremendous honor. And then uh, a little over, how about a year and a half ago, um, as the USS Oklahoma crew was being repatriated, uh, I ha was in the position of giving the keynote eulogy for Chief Petty Officer, um, and his name escapes me right now, Duff Gordon, uh, Rudolph Gordon, um, he, went, he went by Duff, 
Uh, he was missing for many, many, many years. I mean, he remains unidentified. They were in the Punchbowl Cemetery. We're going to get to that in just a second here. And uh, I was the one who was able to uh, obtain a copy of a service record, and everybody at that funeral ca came across feeling like they knew who he was. The chief petty officers who were at that funeral, they didn't feel connected until they understood his, who he was as a chief petty officer. These people then really ex, you know, had shown their pride because they were there representing somebody who was of their rank and they felt like they knew him. And so to this day, you know, Pearl Harbor really is special to me. Um, we're going to take a look right now at one of the uh, survivors from Pearl Harbor. This is from a couple of years ago, and it's a very short clip. Uh, this gentleman was on the USS Maryland, which was birthed right next to the Oklahoma on December 7, 1941. And he's just got a, a brief look at uh, what he recalls from the Oklahoma on that fateful day. You see the Oklahoma upside down. And the first thing they did with us, uh, they put every little boat that uh, didn't, wasn't damaged to work trying to uh, save these people that uh, jumped overboard. We lowered these uh, uh, rope ladders. And those that uh, were not hurt very bad. There were quite a few of them we could put to work. We had to send to the Navy Yard to get blueprints of the bottom of the Oklahoma. But see, it'd be like the floor is the ceiling. And they're walking around on the ceiling, tapping, hoping that we'll hear them. In the last couple of years, the Defense POWMIA Accounting Agency has been working on uh, identifying those remains. As I just mentioned with uh, Chief Petty Officer Duff Gordon uh, in his funeral, he was actually the first of the unknowns to be identified and buried back in the United States. There were two other people who were identified ahead of him, and both of the families, uh, the survivors of uh, those two gentlemen, uh, elected to keep those remains at the Punchbowl Cemetery in Honolulu, uh, with Duff Gordon, his family, elected to have him buried back in Hudson. And so he was the first one of many. Um, in this next video from the uh, Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, they're going to mention 50, but this is a few months old, so the actual number now is over 100 have since been identified and uh, and uh, reburied with proper military honors. So let's take a look at the uh, the um, USS Oklahoma clip from the POWMIA County Command uh, to learn more about their forensic anthropology and this important mission that they have. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. In a surprise assault, American warplanes were caught on the ground and bombed. Most of them were disabled. That crippled our air opposition to the Japs, and their planes were able to swarm over the harbor and bomb and torpedo the warships there. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. At the time of the attack, I was in my room shaving. The word was passed, a way fire and rescue party. I glanced at my clock as I was leaving my room and noticed the time was a few minutes before 8 a.m. 
Back on the third deck, all the lights were out and only a few flashlights were available. About this time, the word came along from man to man to abandon ship. I helped a partially incapacitated man to the second deck and then joined in a line, passing injured men along to the ladder by the dental office. I lost all knowledge of time when here, but after some minutes, Ensign McClellan, who was beside me in the line, said he was feeling faint and then collapsed. I noticed other men dropping around me. I stepped over to pick up Mr. McClellan, but when I stepped over, I got dizzy and fell. I seemed to be paralyzed from the waist down. I had a great difficulty breathing, but enough strength in my arms to drag myself to the ladder and up a couple steps before I collapsed completely. My life is proof of the courage and disregard of personal danger on the part of my unknown shipmates. Daniel Lewis Westfall. Initial recoveries actually began very soon after the incident. So on December 8th through December 16th, they recovered 29 individuals that they were able to identify, but the vast majority they could not identify individually, just they didn't have enough information. The salvage operations, so starting in July of 1942 until May of 1944, the operations began. The remains had been in the ship for several years, decomposed and placed. Um, they were already commingled at that point when the recovery operations had started. So they put all of the lower limbs in one casket, all of the skulls in one casket, which really kind of even furthered the, the commingling issue. April of 2015, SECDEF put forward guidance for us to disinter all of the remains from the USS Oklahoma, which started this um, big identification effort that we're doing. We had the, the first identification within three months. Currently, we have over 50 identifications from the project, from this last disinterment, and we expect um, to have the majority of the individuals identified in the next four years. I don't think families ever can get closure, but they, they can get answers and get the pieces of their puzzle back together. Back in August, the remains of Quentin John Gifford were returned to his family in Minnesota. I actually just found out while playing that clip when I was just trying to see if Quentin's uh, remains had been reburied that I had just discovered that his uh, brother Earl passed away in, uh, on December 30th of 2016 uh, at age 95. Now I did not know Earl but Harold, his, uh, their other brother, is a friend of mine and so I last I knew that Earl was still alive but I did not know that Earl had passed and then um, in, uh, in uh, August Quentin Gifford finally came home to rest. I do not know if the family actually has reburied him uh, or what their plans are. I have not been able to find anything and I, I just I haven't I haven't called Harold. Uh, just for a while I was just giving space and then I've had other things and it's like ah, did Quentin ever get buried? I don't know. But the fact is I'm really happy. Uh, I'm, I'm disheartened in the fact that Earl w didn't live long enough to get that closure that his brother was coming home to be buried. That's what is kind of shaking me up right now. Um, Earl was always hopeful that they would identify him and bring him home. 
Hal was always hopeful. Hal's still alive. And then they have a sister, uh, June, and she is also very thankful. And I know June and Hal and I have communicated over the last couple of years since this whole repatriation effort occurred. Uh, and they were always, you know, looking very, very forward to that day coming. And uh, they were extremely anxious that, you know, that was not a patient process for them to endure after they had given the uh, DNA samples for uh, DNA matching. So Quentin is home. And uh, Congressman Tom Emmer took a moment to make reference to that in general remarks on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. Here's what Congressman Emmer had to say. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize one of Minnesota's finest military families who fought during our nation's darkest hour. I would especially like to remember one family member who made the ultimate sacrifice and who, after more than a half century, will finally be returned and laid to rest in his loved home state. Quinton, Earl, and Harold Gifford all bravely served our nation during World War II. While Earl and Harold made it home safely, Quinton, who served on the USS Oklahoma, died in the attack on Pearl Harbor. For 75 years, Quinton remained in the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific until this year, when his remains were finally identified. The identification of Quinton has brought relief and closure to his family, who never forgot the brother they lost. The Giffords are happy to have the chance to give Quinton the memorial he deserves. I speak for all Minnesotans when I say we are happy to finally welcome home a hero like Quinton. And that was Congressman Tom Emmer's uh, speech from back in August. Now, we, now that we're talking about Congress, we do have to talk about the big news of the day. Uh, this goes back a couple of, uh, about a month ago, and I spent pretty much a whole show on it, talking about Al Franken. And the thing I mentioned at the time was that there's going to be more accusers, that more people are going to come out. Al Franken had that kind of character. We'd even shown you the angry Al ad. Well, uh, this morning, Senator Al Franken has announced that he is resigning from the U.S. Senate. So we're going to show you his resignation speech. I was going to originally play the entire 11-minute speech, but what we are going to do is play it for a little while, but I'm going to cut back early. Uh, but the entire speech is out there on YouTube if you wanted to see the whole thing. But we are going to watch some of it first, and then we're going to go through the rest of the program from there. A couple months ago, I felt that we had entered an important moment in the history of this country. We were finally beginning to listen to women about the ways in which men's actions affect them. The moment was long overdue. I was excited for that conversation and hopeful that it would result in real change that made life better for women all across the country and in every part of our society. Then the conversation turned to me. Over the last few weeks, a number of women have come forward to talk about how they felt my actions had affected them. I was, I was shocked. I was upset. But in responding to their claims, I also wanted to be respectful of that broader conversation. Because all women deserve to be heard and their experiences taken seriously. I think that was the right thing to do. I also think it gave some people the false impression that I was admitting to doing things that, in fact, I haven't done. Some of the allegations against me are simply not true. Others I remember very differently. I said at the outset that the Ethics Committee was the right venue for these allegations to be heard and investigated and evaluated on their merits. 
that I was prepared to cooperate fully, and that I was confident in the outcome. You know, an important part of the conversation we've been having the last few months has been about how men abuse their power and privilege to hurt women. I am proud that during my time in the Senate, I have used my power to be a champion of women, and that I have earned a reputation as someone who respects the women I work alongside every day. I know there's been a very different picture of me painted over the last few weeks, but I know who I really am. Serving in the United States Senate has been the great honor of my life. I know in my heart that nothing I have done as a senator, nothing, has brought this honor on, on this institution. And I am confident that the Ethics Committee would agree. Nevertheless, today I am announcing that in the coming weeks, I will be resigning as a member of the United States Senate. I, of all people, am aware that there is some irony in the fact that I am leaving while a man who has bragged on tape about his history of sexual assault sits in the Oval Office, and a man who has repeatedly preyed on young girls' campaigns for the Senate with the, with the full support of his party. But this decision is not about me. It's about the people of Minnesota. And it's become clear that I can't both pursue the Ethics Committee process and at the same time remain an effective senator for them. Let me be clear. I may be resigning my seat, but I am not giving up my voice. I will continue to stand up for the things I believe in as a citizen and as an activist. But Minnesotans deserve a senator who can focus with all her energy on addressing the challenges they face every day. There is a big part of me that will always regret having to walk away from this job with so much work left to be done. But I have faith that the work will continue because I have faith in the people who have helped me do it. I have faith in the dedicated, funny, selfless, brilliant young men and women on my staff. They have so much more to contribute to our country. And I hope that, as disappointed as they may feel today, everyone who has worked for me knows how much I admire and respect them. I have faith in my colleagues, especially my senior senator, Amy Klobuchar. I would not have been able to do this job without her guidance and wisdom. And I have faith, or at least hope, that members of this Senate will find the political courage necessary to keep asking the tough questions, hold this administration accountable, and stand up for the truth. I have faith in the activists who organized to help me win my first campaign and who have kept on organizing to help fight for the people who needed us, kids facing bullying, seniors worried about the price of prescription drugs, Native Americans. Okay, and so now we've gotten through his non-apology apology, his announcement that he's going to resign from the Senate, but he never actually gives us a date. But did you notice one important thing in there? He talks about the next senator as being a her. I thought in today's day and age we were supposed to use gender neutral pronouns according to those on the left. Fact is, here's what I think is happening. I think that there's a shakedown, and I've said this before, but I do think that uh, 
granted there's been a bunch of other accusers so I'm not here to disregard that at all uh, as a matter of fact we're going to go into the one in just a second but I do think that a lot of this has to deal with the political posturing for the 2018 election and that Chuck Schumer the uh, Democrat leader of the Senate and other senators possibly Gillibrand and Warren pretty much told Al Franken that you're done I do think that Governor Dayton has made his mind up as to who is going to replace Franken now they're waiting until Tuesday because what's on Tuesday the special election in Alabama so they're going to come in and use the results from what happens there uh, into this somehow I don't know exactly what they have in mind there is political posturing here uh, take for just one second here what the process is now once we actually do know the definitive date of Senator Franken's resignation and we know who the interim appointee is because the governor will appoint an interim appointment I personally think it's going to be Lieutenant Governor Tina Smith uh, there's been some stuff on Politico that points in that direction however it is still ultimately going to be whoever the governor decides and and so we'll find out who that's going to be in short order but what happens then is that there's going to be a special election in order to uh, make a make permanent the replacement for the duration of the term which means in November, the November general election of 2018 we will have two US senators on the uh, US Senate positions on the ballot first time since 1978 that we've had that in Minnesota uh, when uh, Boschwitz and Durenberger were elected so Amy Klobuchar will be up for re-election for the entire six-year term and then in 2018 you will also have the replacement candidate for Al Franken up uh, on the same ballot for the remainder of that term which means they will have to then come back and uh, do another vote for the Franken seat in 2020 because that's when that seat would norm that term would normally expire and then things kind of get back to normal so that's what's going to happen here and we're going to have Republicans and Democrats campaigning really really hard for that seat possibly both seats now uh, and it's going to be a wild election year I can promise you that already it should be a wild election year the governor constitutional officers members of Congress and both senators it's going to be a crowded ballot it is going to be a crowded TV airwaves in October of next year I can promise you that um, I mentioned that there was another accuser uh, we actually did talk about her um, about well when the story broke last month Melanie Morgan she uh, um, made some allegations but I want you to see this from her own words from her own mouth it's not so much sexual harassment but the nature of the harassment that she had undergone by Senator Franken back before he was a senator and I was one of the panelists one of the guests I was the token conservative and um, Al Franken was the liberal along with a lieutenant former lieutenant governor of Colorado and actor Billy Baldwin uh, I was involved in just a, a kind of a, a really a mundane argument over policy numbers and about you know the uh, budget numbers and making some sort of point about that but I'll tell you what, Al Franken got right in my face and he just kept coming back over the top and I would challenge him um, about those numbers and he would come back over the top. Finally, the show was over and Laura, he trailed me, stalked me back really to the green room where he got in my face again, got very aggressive with me. I felt physically intimidated and then he followed me out of the studio and I thought the story would end there, but it did not. Apparently, he got my phone number from the sh one of the show producers and he started calling me at home and harassing me about trying to prove to me how right he was and finally on the third phone call I told him if he didn't back off 
that I was going to call the police and make a police report about his behavior. I found it so creepy and so disturbing and obsessively weird. And it's an experience that has informed me about him all these years. I never could understand why the people of Minnesota elected him as a United States senator. And yes, I did talk about it in uh, live on the radio on my talk show in San Francisco, the Lee Rogers and Melanie Morgan show um, after it happened. So I didn't stay silent about it. But it's funny, Laura, because people don't really they didn't seem to really care about that sort of behavior until just recently. And there you have it. That came right from Melanie Morgan. And again, the stories surrounding Al Franken are legendary. Um, now, what's the reaction been? Uh, we're going to show you two clips back to back, uh, both from um, uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar, Governor Dayton, along with uh, two Hamlin University students. A fellow Democrat, Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, says that Franken made the right decision. She went on to say in a statement, in every workplace in America, including the U.S. Senate, we must confront the challenges of harassment and misconduct. Also just into the newsroom, Governor Mark Dayton's statement saying he extends his deepest regrets to the women who have had to endure their unwanted experiences with Senator Franken. As a personal friend, my heart also goes out to Al and his family during this difficult time. I was shocked. I was upset. But in responding, it has been the great honor of my life. Um, I'm really glad that he's stepping down. He obviously knows his place. I wish I could say the same for some other people that are in office that could step down. Because when you do something, you should have consequences. And I think that him being a senator will show other people in America and not only Minnesota that this is what you do after something happens. You apologize and you leave your office. I think society is moving in the direction of believing the accusers, uh, which is very important. I mean, obviously with his voting record, he's been a huge ally to women in the past um, in his time at the Senate. but. It just goes to show you, like, this behavior is unexcusable no matter who you are and no matter how you use your power. Al Franken served the people. So, this is where I'm going to actually defend Senator Franken, though. I actually have to defend Senator Franken. I don't defend his behavior. What I defend is the ability of due process. I came out and agreed that that Senate investigation, the Senate ethics investigation needs to be complete. And I really do believe that it needs to be complete. I do believe that the Fifth Amendment guarantees us the right to face our accusers. And I don't think that Senator Franken has received that justice. Uh, I, I can completely understand why he's a little, little bit belligerent in his remarks. At the same time, I can understand why he feels that he is at the point of having to resign. I do think that what we're seeing right now reeks of McCarthyism. Seriously. McCar you know, the whole communist uh, witch hunt, there was a lot of accusers, a lot of anonymous accusers. And there was no real due process in all of that. And you had Hollywood blacklisting and whole nine yards. We can do a whole show on McCarthyism. And the fact is, that's kind of what's happening right now. You make an allegation, oh, you've got to resign your seat. I think there needs to be something a little bit more well-defined. But that will also be a, another show for another day because we've got two more clips to show you. Uh, we're going to show you that as it ends, Franken's political career began in controversy. Let's take a look. Al Franken served the people of Minnesota as their junior senator for eight and a half years, and just as his political career is ending, his beginning was marked in turmoil and controversy. Even before Franken won DFL endorsement to challenge then-Senator Norm Coleman, he was defending past comments regarding sexual insensitivities. As Bill Hudson explains, he first won election to the Senate by the narrowest victory in state history. I'm going to do a terrific show today because I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Long before we called him senator, we knew him as a comic. Please welcome Al Franken. The St. Louis Park kid who got us to laugh on Saturday Night Live. Uh, Dennis, that introduction was written by me, Al Franken. 
From comedy to a voice of liberalism, his nationally syndicated radio show was a Democrat's alternative to Rush Limbaugh. The Al Franken show is on the air. To win back the seat of Paul Wellstone, Franken challenged Senator Norm Coleman in 2008. Early on, Franken's past comic parodies of sexual harassment nearly stopped him. He gave an apology and delegates gave him the endorsement. I'm sorry for that. The general election ended deadlock, forcing a recount. Six months later, the Minnesota Supreme Court declared Franken the winner by the slimmest of margins, 312 votes of nearly 3 million cast. I'm also humbled, not just by the closeness of this election, but by the enormity of the responsibility that comes with this office. Franken's tenure championed veterans benefits, health care, net neutrality and college financing. You guys want to end the ex expansion of Medicaid. That has people in Minnesota scared out of their mind. But it was Franken's tough questioning at confirmation hearings that created his 2020 presidential buzz until political ambitions became no match for past indiscretion. Bill Hudson, WCCO, 4 News. So we will now see what's going to happen as Senator Franken leaves office. Since we, today is the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, we are going to leave you with our music. Go ahead and just start playing the clip as we have the U.S. Navy sea chanters with God Bless America in tribute to those who died at Pearl Harbor. Reminding you that there are 17 shopping days left until Christmas, and thanks for watching.